continue on here in our series, we're quickly making our way through the history of the true church in the midst of the Dark Ages. We're working our way through there. You remember the Dark Ages? Uh, we are right now in 2023. So the Dark Ages, the church, of course, born in 32 A.D., and then the Dark Ages start in 500, and they go for about 1,000 years until about 1500 A.D., Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, that he would build his church. The gates of hell would not prevail against it. And so we're watching that, uh, that promise be fulfilled. As God, from the time that the church began all the way up until the present day, God has always had a remnant. Though sometimes it's been a very, very small one. He's always had a remnant who have held to the true doctrines of Scripture. I've mentioned uh, this as we've been going through this study, the, the importance of separation. If you understand the importance of sound doctrine, you understand the importance of doctrinal purity, that logically leads to separation. And so throughout the years, from the foundation of the church, obviously it started just after the cross, but that's a good visual reference, all the way up from the time when Jesus said, I'll, I will build my church, and the church is born in Acts chapter 2, all the way up to the present, we have a solid line of sound doctrine from that time. And you see all of the, the named groups all throughout there. That's, that's the, those are some of the names, certainly not all of them, but some of the names of those who have held to sound doctrine throughout this time. Because of this separation, because of the separation that these uh, groups had over sound doctrine, many of them who were part of the true church underwent terrible persecution, especially from the Catholic Church. The Roman Catholic Church had a, uh, a, a very real zeal to, to constrain people to join the church. Or in their, their words, to come back to the truth. The Catholics believing that they have the truth. The Catholic Church in this time, due to a lack of separation between church and state, the Catholic Church held tremendous power. And they were able to use the arm of the state to enforce religious rules. If you didn't, uh, if you didn't have your infant baptized, you would be getting a visit. And you wouldn't be getting a visit from the priest, you would be getting a visit from the soldiers who would constrain you to go before the priest. Another thing that made this a very dark time was the illiteracy, the lack of access to scripture, and the fact that most of the copies of the Bible were in Latin. This posed a unique challenge to those who were trying to remain true. Now, we're going to, to deal with that a little bit more today. We're going to talk about the beginning as scripture began to be translated into the common tongue here this morning. So far, we've looked at two main groups, well, three. We've looked at the Donatists, we've looked at the Paulicians, and last week we looked at the Petrobutians. The Petrobutians held to the uh, doctrinal beliefs that are found in God's Word. And last week, we went through and I gave you the, the, the doctrine, and then we kind of backed it up from Scripture. Just to, to make the point, the doctrines that they held to, the doctrines that our brothers and sisters in Christ of years and centuries and even in millennium past, the doctrines that they held to are still the same doctrines that we hold to today. They haven't changed, and, and we're not adding new doctrines. Aren't you glad of that? We're going to talk about that in just a few moments. The Petrobutians were officially labeled as heretics uh, by the Catholic Church in 1119, and they underwent great persecution because of their insistence on doctrinal purity. So this morning we're going to come to a group that maybe you've heard about this group. They are the Waldensians. How many of you ever heard, anybody ever heard the name Waldensian? Okay, my wife has heard it. Okay. Well, I talk about things to my wife. So. Uh, the Waldensians trace their origin back to the reign of Constantine. They would claim to be one of the first and longest lasting of these groups. They got their name from a man named Peter Waldo. He was a wealthy merchant from Lyon, France. Uh, his dates 1170 to 1215 AD. When Peter Waldo trusted Christ at his conversion, he took seriously the command to forsake all and follow Christ. That was something that he took to heart. 
And so he, again, he was a wealthy merchant. He turned his back on his fortune. He walked away from tremendous wealth and decided to dedicate his life solely to the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. His followers came to be known as poor men. That was their title, poor men, due to their giving up of worldly possessions in order to follow Jesus. If you were to look, and we're not going to go down deep, but I want to just give you, the, the reason that I'm giving you these names is so that you can, you can say, I, I know where we've come from. I can see the line from which we've come. The history of the Waldensians was one of separation. Once again, they, they were willing to separate. Let me give you a little bit of information from them. This is written by them. They said, now it is evident, as well in the Old as in the New Testament, that a Christian stands bound by express command given to him to separate himself from Antichrist, in their case, the Roman Church. Be it known unto everyone in general, and in particular, that the, camp, that the cause of our separation is this, namely, for the real truth's sake of the faith, and by reason of our inward knowledge of the only true God. Does that sound like it was written by a lawyer a little bit? It kind of has all those words in there that you would find in a legal document. Talking about the, the separation that you find in the, in the Old Testament. Do we find separation in the Old Testament? Talk, talk, talk to me about it. Where, where do we find separation in the Old Testament? Well, Israel and God were supposed to be separate when they went into the promised land. Absolutely. Israel supposed to be separate. That's part of not being or mingle with the others. Yeah, absolutely. They were to, in, in the case, they go into the land of Canaan. What did God say to do? Did he say, go in there, make friends, try to join hands, join arms, find common ground with the Canaanites? Is that what God said? No, he said, go in, wipe them out. There are to be none of them. Why, why would God say that? Well, because he wanted his people to be, to use his words, a peculiar people. We've gone through Leviticus recently in our family, and it's tedious. Then we went through Deuteronomy with our family. Very tedious as you go through. And you read all of these rules about how the Jews were to look and the way that they were to conduct themselves, the way they were to plant their fields. The type of animals they were to plow with. Everything about them was to be different and separate. So we find very definitely the doctrine of separation in the Old Testament as God is, is using separation to maintain a people dedicated to him. And we see the same thing in the New Testament. We see the command of God that we'll look at again to come out from among them and be ye separate. In, the, in, in Peter, he, he speaks of that we are to be a royal generation, a peculiar people. We are supposed to be stand apart from the world around us. We're supposed to be noticeably different. <clears throat> Let me give you just some of the doctrines. We've gone over these recently, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. The Waldensians believed in the atoning death of Christ. Is that important? They believed in the atoning death of Christ as the only means of atonement. That's important. They believed in the Trinity. Is that important? Why is the Trinity important? Why can't we? I mean, it's, I mean, honestly, it's a hard doctrine to even explain all the way. We can't really get our minds all the way around the Trinity. Why is it important? Well, if you remember, the Trinity ties directly to the deity of Christ. When you start saying, well, I don't believe in the Trinity, then you're starting to say that you don't believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Yes, sir? I may, <clears throat> I may have missed this early. Are these Jews or Gentiles? Gentiles. 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 Yeah, they're in France. So if you have oh. Frank, Frankish history, you may tie back to them. They believed in the denial of the existence of purgatory. They believed in the universal priesthood of the believer. Now, what, now that's a word we don't, uh, a phrase we don't use a whole lot. What is the universal priesthood of the believer? Well, you would say it this way, that I don't need a priest to go to God for me. I can go directly into the presence of God. I don't have to go and sit in a little closet uh, with, a, with a screen between me and another man and confess my sins to him. Rather, I can go directly into the presence of God. I don't, I don't have to go use a confessor. I don't have to have a priest 
to be a, a mediator. I don't need the saints, which is what we'll talk about also. I can go directly into the presence of God. These are, these are doctrines that we hold to. Again, the same line of doctrine that we believed all the way at the beginning, we just pull it all the way up to the present. We're still holding the same doctrines. We believe in, well, they believe in the rejection of Gnosticism. Gnosticism, again, is uh, the Gnostics rejected all of the physical, and they only believe that that which is, is spiritual can be holy. When you start going down that road, you end up finding that you can't believe in the atonement of Christ and not believe that he had a physical body. You have to have both in order to move along. Now, how many of you know what a catechism is? You know what a catechism is? Yeah. A catechism is a summary of religious doctrine. Okay, that's the, the, the basic definition. And it usually takes the form of a question and answer. It's a very effective means of teaching, especially of teaching children. In a catechism, it would be me asking one of my daughters, Audrey, who is Jesus Christ? And her saying to me, Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Come in the flesh, dying in our place, rising again on the third day, and ever living to make intercession for us. That would be a catechism. If I ask her the question, she gives me kind of a kind of a rote answer, but it's a good way of getting information into your head. But that's not the answer that the Catholics would expect. The Catholics would believe the, the thing is, is that a lot of times we hear the word catechism and we say, nope, nope, have no, have nothing to do with the catechism right. because of the Catholics' use of it. The Catholics use it to give their doctrine. You know who else uses catechism? Muslims and Hindus. You know who else uses catechism? Waco High School and, and every other school that you've been in, they use different types of catechism where the teacher asks a question, at least when I was in school, and they expected the right answer. Now I know they don't insist so much on the right answer anymore. They're willing to take whatever if you can show your work. But in the days when I was growing up and when you were growing up, if the teacher asked you what is a noun, you would say a noun is a person, place, thing, or idea. You didn't get to make up your own definition. You had to say what it was. That's a catechism in its basic form. Let me give you some of the Waldensian catechism here just to kind of help you get it into your mind what these people believe. Because again, what they believed is what we believe because of Scripture. The minister would ask, by what marks are those people known who are not in the truth within the church? So this would be uh, the, the pastor, the leader of worship, would ask this question. Here's the answer. They would say that you would know a person who is not in truth by public sins and by an erroneous faith. For we ought to fly from such persons, lest we be defiled by. How can you know someone who's not a believer? How can you know if someone's not saved? Well, I don't know you can. If, if they come up to you and they say, I don't believe in Jesus Christ, right? That, that's pretty obvious. That's a, that's a kind of a low bar to clear. If they come up to you and they deny the basic doctrines of the faith, what would give you, now you can't know, but what would give you reason to believe or at least to suspect that someone is not in the faith. By their emotions. By their actions, by their works, right? The Bible says uh, in Matthew 7, 20, it says, Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Okay? John 7, 24 says that, we, that a lot of times people will grab on to verses in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. They'll say, well, the Bible says don't judge. Okay? That don't judge lest ye be judged and condemned. Okay? The Bible specifically tells us in John 7, 24 to judge righteous judgments. You judge all the time. You have judged many times this morning. That's the reason you put on the shirt you did and not the shirt you didn't. Because you judged between the two and you decided, I'm going to wear this because it matches or whatever, <laughs> whatever your criteria is for putting on clothing. I'm going to wear this. That's a judgment call. 
And we, as believers, and these are brothers and sisters in Christ from years gone by, they would look at, at the, the Catholic doctrines. They'd say, okay, what they say does not line up with this. Therefore, I judge that to be, what's the, what's the $10 word we should use? Wrong. <laughs> this, is, this is not right because this is right. What they're saying goes against it. That's what these brothers and sisters in Christ would say. Yes, sir. Did these folks have, uh, they had the whole Bible in their language at that time? No. So, well, no, they didn't. They had the whole Bible, but not in their language. Okay. They had the whole Bible, and it would have been in Latin. And so the, Wal the Waldensians, these, these people, they would have had <laughs> people who had been taught, who could read Latin, who would read the Bible, and give it to them in in their own language. How much how much headwinds other than the Catholics did these Waldensians face? Was that, I mean, I understand that's probably their main competitor for your, for Latin. Certainly, that was where they got most of their their pushback from. Would have been from the Catholics. Going here on this catechism. Once we have judged someone to be an error based on God's word, not based on their personality, not based on anything other than God's word. If somebody comes up and they say to you, I don't believe in the Trinity. I don't think Jesus is the son of God. You can say, based on scripture, you can say, well, you're wrong. This is right. I'm going to stand on truth. What are we supposed to do with those who espouse false doctrine? What should we do? Well, we can speak to them and we can say, look, I'm concerned with the doctrine that you're taking, but you're wrong. But also, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 6, 5, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such, withdraw thyself. What would be another synonym for withdraw? It starts with an S. Separate. Separate from them. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, we've looked at this repeatedly through this study. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Why is separation from false doctrine necessary? Well, Hebrews 11, 13, or 11, 15 says, Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Why should we separate over, over doctrine? Well, because false doctrine has an infectious nature. False doctrine is pervasive. You say, if, if somebody says, I don't believe in the Trinity, therefore, I don't believe in the deity. I don't believe Jesus Christ was really God. I think he was just a good man who had good teachings and he died for them. That's their, their, their error. That's the, the core of their error. What areas of life does that affect? Absolutely all of them. Right? There is no portion of Bible doctrine that is not affected if you take away the, the deity of Jesus Christ. If you take away that Jesus was God, then Jesus can't die for us. If Jesus didn't die for us, then we're still in our sins. When we die, we're bound for hell. It's just if, if you take away doctrine, then you're going into very dangerous ground. Let me give you another portion of their catechism. The minister, the, the leader of this, would ask, by what marks is the undue administration of the sacraments known? Now, what is a sacrament? Some sacrifice. Some sacrifice. So, sit close. Communion. Communion would be considered a sacrament. A sacrament, as the Catholics would define it, would be a means of grace. They would say that if you partake of communion... If you partake of, they have seven sacraments. If you engage in these sacraments, then you receive grace. By your works, you're doing the sacrament, you receive grace. Do you have any problem with that just on the surface? Okay. That's, that's receiving grace by works. And if you receive grace by works, the Bible tells us in Romans, it's not grace. Okay, You can't earn grace. So... In this case, when they're talking about the sacraments, they would be referring to the ordinances. Okay? The ordinances would be, we believe in two. Some people believe in three. The ordinances would be the Lord's table or communion, baptism, 
And then perhaps many of you would be familiar with some who believe to, in the ordinance of foot washing. Familiar with that? That's kind of a, a popular thing, especially among certain, uh, certain sects. Here's the answer. By what marks is the undue administration of the sacraments known? The answer, when the priest, not knowing the intention of Christ in the sacrament, says that the grace and truth are included in the external ceremonies and persuade men to participate of the sacrament without the truth and without faith. That's a long way of saying you know that there's something wrong with the celebration of the Lord's table when the priest says the body of Christ and gives you this and you feel that you were receiving the literal body of Christ. When you feel like the, when, when the priest or the leader of the communion, when he is, is making it so that if you take this piece of bread, this bit of juice, then you are receiving Christ literally. That's a problem. What are we doing when we partake of the bread and the juice? Well, we are remembering, we're identifying, we're obeying, but we're not partaking in the suffering of Christ. We're not offering Jesus Christ afresh and anew. Once again, the understanding of the importance of doctrinal purity led to separation. And as a result of that separation, the Catholics bitterly opposed and persecuted the Waldensians. If you were to read, and I would encourage you, if you're interested in this, if you go online and you do some research, you will find, as I mentioned a couple weeks ago, that most of what we're reading about, when you read the history, it was written by the Catholics, because the Catholics had the arm of the, the state behind them, and they put to death many of their enemies. If you read about Peter Waldo in the writings of the Catholics, he's depicted as a villain and a heretic because they disagreed. He said, I'm going to stand on scripture. The Catholic Church said, we're going to stand on tradition. On the cathedral in Lyon, France, Peter Waldo is depicted as a gargoyle. You know what a gargoyle is? It's basically, it's the, where the water comes out of the gutter and it pours out. This is Peter Waldo as a gargoyle. You notice anything weird about this gargoyle? If you ever know anything about gargoyles, gargoyles usually face down, the water comes out of their mouth or something like that. But if you'll note here, what's, what's different about this? He's looking, up. He's looking up. The Catholics did this. If you'll note, his head is where the water comes out, meaning his head is hollow, empty. The Catholics did that on purpose. They're trying to, to get in a dig at a man who's long since passed. They also have that he, he's not preaching towards man. He's preaching towards the sky. And their, their goal in saying as much was that his preaching amounted to nothing. His, his teaching amounted to nothing. This is uh, an age-long way of poking fun at a man who the Catholics disagreed with. And the reason they disagreed with him is because he was willing to separate over doctrine. He was excommunicated, which you didn't necessarily have to be a part of the Catholic Church to be excommunicated. They would excommunicate you, which means they, in their words, they're condemning you to eternal damnation. In 1184, and the Waldensians were declared heretics by name in 1215. Once again, the Catholic Church turned the earth red with the blood of those who stood against them and stood for sound doctrine. They forcibly, and you can read about this very well chronicled, they forcibly took the children of Waldensian parents. They would go in, they would remove the children from the home, they would take them away, and they would raise them in a Catholic home or in a Catholic institution where they could be brought up in the heretical doctrines of the Catholic Church. In Marindol, France, they massacred hundreds, if not thousands, of Waldensians in this particular village. The Catholics took over. They massacred most, if not all, of the Waldensians who lived therein. That was their method of taking care of those who disagreed with them. Let me give you just a, a, a Catholic author who summed up the Waldensian movement. So this is written by their enemies. I want you to listen to this and listen for what you... Listen for something you disagree with. Ready? It says, But contempt for the power of the church, which was the basis of the heresy, they're talking about the Catholic church, led the Waldenses into a much more radical attitude. In their view, priests of the Roman church had lost their authority, and churches were useless, churches were useless religious chants superfluous, and it was futile to observe the feast of the saints and pray to them. 
They also violently attack the doctrine of purgatory and its consequences and scoff at indulgences. What do you say to that? I say, amen. That's exactly what we believe. And you know why we believe it? Because the Bible says so. These are people who suffered greatly, suffered the loss of fortune and family and, and life itself. For this, they violently oppose the doctrines that are opposed by Scripture. <clears throat> now, somebody... I have a question. Yes. So The Apocrypha is the portion that the Catholics add to Scripture. And if you do some research on it, you'll find that the Apocrypha used to be part of all of our Bibles. If you know about the, the 1611 version of Scripture, and you talk about up to the 1769, which is, if you carry a King James Bible, you're carrying a 1769, not a, not a 1611. You probably don't know anybody who's ever carried a 1611. I know I don't, because they're impossible to read at least with any regularity. The, they're written in Old English, where the F's, and, and S is actually an F. That was how they wrote in that, that time. So just difficult to read, possible, but to stand and read from a 1611, very difficult. During those times, up until, I can't remember the exact date, the, the Apocrypha is the portion of, of, they would say, Scripture. We would say it's the portion of history that fits between the Testament. So following Malachi and preceding Matthew, you have the Apocrypha, and it contains, it contains, I, I've read it, I have a copy of it if you're interested in it, it's easy to find online. It's interesting history. It's where it contains the story of, if you want to know where Hanukkah came from, you want to know where that, that feast, and you want to understand the Maccabean revolt, and all of that stuff, it's all contained in the Apocrypha, which is what the Catholics take, they have it in their Bible, if you go to Goodwill and you see a Catholic Bible, and you open it up, you'll find extra books. You'll find the book of Maccabees and the book of Ecclesiasticus. And they have a book called The Rest of the Book of Esther. Okay, So there's all of these books that form up the Apocrypha. I, I think I've mentioned this before, but it's been some time. Do you know, remember what Apocrypha means, anybody? It, it means doubtful. They are the doubtful writings. They, they're not inspired. And so... On the basis of that, I would say you, you go in there and, and you, you bring that up. If you have a, a Catholic person who insists upon it, the Apocrypha, I, I can stand before you and I can confidently say that this book is without error and without contradiction. Okay, You can go, this book, written over the thousands of years that it was by 40 different authors on three different continents, and it's without error, without contradiction. If you add the Apocrypha in, then you cannot make that statement because the Apocrypha very obviously has contradictions even within itself. Okay, it goes into it goes into error. The Apocrypha is where the Catholics. It's the only source text that they have for purgatory. That's where they go. They would go to the doubtful writings, and and that's where they build it. So. In, in trying to combat that, in talking to somebody and explaining to them that it's not, you can go into the history of it, but it, if you read, and, and the, the copy of the Apocrypha that I have in, on the shelf in my office is written, it was, it was the copy that was in our version of Scripture, the 1769 King James Version. So it's the same exact verbiage. It reads the same way, but yet it's different. And the reason why is because the Bible says of itself that the Word of God is quick, it's powerful, it's sharper than any two-edged sword. You, you can tell, if you read, you can tell there's a difference between reading God's Word and reading a book written by man. There's, there's a difference. When you read the Apocrypha, it's different. There's something, there's something you say, no, that's not right. There's a check that you will find if you were to read through it. Like I said, interesting history but not reliable doctrine. Not even reliable history in all cases. It has errors even when it comes to history, but it gives us a kind of a nod in the right direction on the good bit of stuff. 
When was that removed? Uh, off the top of my head, I don't remember. Late 1700s, early 1800s. And, and the reason it was removed is because it is the doubtful writings. Who, who was responsible then for pointing this out? Well, they knew from the beginning when they put it, when they, we could, sometime we'll talk about the canonization of scripture yeah. and how how we got 66 books in our Bible instead of 76. And, and we'll, we'll go down that path. Off the top of my head, I couldn't give you the dates and the names of, of the people who did it. But the reason the Apocrypha was kept together as a group instead of, there's, if you read the Apocrypha, there are two more chapters to the book of Daniel. There's a couple more chapters to the book of Esther. They didn't put them on the book of Esther. They didn't put them on the book of Daniel. And they didn't put them where they would fit historically and chronologically because they are doubtful writings. And there was a, there was a cloud of doubt around them. So they said, nope, we're not going to add that. We, we understand what is the inspired, preserved word of God. This is not part of it. Good question. Let me give you something. I think this will interest you. I had somebody ask me last week or the week before about the timing of some of the Catholic doctrines. Okay, Let me give you some of the timing for the adoption of Catholic doctrines. Because I made the statement earlier, even this morning, that we have God's word. And we're not adding doctrines. We're not, we don't come up with doctrines and we gather together as a church and I inform you, oh, by the way, we have a new doctrine that we're going to add. No, we have all the doctrine that we need. Not so with the Catholics. In 250 AD, they instituted the baptism of infants. Now, this took multiple different shapes. Uh, at first, they believed in the immersion of infants, totally placing a small baby underwater. You can imagine quickly why that <laughs> didn't fly along, okay? But it lasted for some centuries. They, that, because in the, in the beginning, all baptism, given the, the definition of the word, all baptism was by immersion, but they instituted the baptism of infants in 250. In 300 AD was when you first saw someone give the sign of the cross. If you've ever been uh, around a Catholic person and seen them cross themselves, that was instituted in 300. In 379, praying to Mary and the saints, Lent, when you see somebody walking around with dirt on their forehead, that was instituted in 519 AD. Before that, it didn't exist. Nobody, nobody did the whole Lent thing. In 526, last rites, 1009 was when holy water started. Again, holy water had multiple iterations. At one point, holy water was a, it was water with salt in it, and it had been blessed by a priest, and eventually it kind of took different forms. In 1079, they instituted the celibacy of the priests. Meaning that priests, before that, priests would marry, have children, have families, 1079. They weren't supposed to. Guess what happened if you do some research? They still married, and they still had children, sometimes out of wedlock. In 1190, they had the sale of indulgences. We talked about this just a little bit last week. It's the get out of jail free card where you say, I'm, I feel like going out and doing something, so I'm going to pay some money, get, get my forgiveness, and then I'm going to go do what I want. Obviously, that's unbiblical, but we could go all the way up, and if I were to carry this list out, the reason I stopped here is because it's still in the Dark Ages. I may continue this at another point. You can go all the way up to 1980s, like the 1980s that, that we lived in, and you can know that they're still adding doctrine. There's still new doctrines that roll out of the Catholic Church. These, this list could be much longer, but... You'll note, can you give me Bible on any of these? Can you give me Bible that supports any of these? Not one. <laughs> Not one. And if I gave you the whole list, you'd find you wouldn't find any there either. Yes. Was the Pope <coughs> original to the start? And was it or was they always infallible? No. The infallibility of the Pope is a very new doctrine. Within the last, I would say definitely within the last 300 years. But it's uh, a new, when, when a pope speaks, they call it ex cathedra. That means they're speaking in the place of God. And it makes them infallible, not, not infallible on all matters, they would say, but infallible on all matters of doctrine and church business, which 
Is there something that kind of rubs you wrong about a religion where the guy gets to say, I'm always right? Yeah. That, that should rub you wrong. That, just rub, that, that goes against kind of the grain that we know in Scripture. The Bible tells us that all men have sinned, but they, they go and they pull all of this aside. Here's the blessing in, in looking at a list like this. The blessing is this. Psalm 119.89 tells us, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. The word of God is to be our final authority in matters of faith and practice and life. 2 Peter 1.3 says, According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, as Bible-believing Christians, as believers who build our lives and build our practice upon the Word of God, we're not bound to look to a council or a synod to inform us of new doctrine that have been decided upon. Rather, we look to God's Word. The fact that I, I've made the statement multiple times, there's nothing new in theology except heresy. When, when somebody comes up with a new doctrine, it's wrong. And the reason why is because the Word of God is not changing. The Word of God is forever settled in heaven. So when we start hearing about these, these new doctrines, write them off out of hand. Now, may there be a doctrine that I haven't studied out all the way to the bottom and I don't understand all the ins and outs of it. Yes. In fact, there are. All doctrines. You're never going to get everything that you can get out of God's word. But when somebody comes up with a new thought and they try to make it doctrine or dogma, it would be the word that the Catholics would use. When they try to make that where you must abide by what I say God is saying now, that's a problem. We don't have to change our beliefs. Our beliefs, which is one neat thing about the study of church history, we've looked at the writings of people from millennia ago. And we still hold to the same exact doctrines. We still hold to, to what we've talked about, the, the deity of Christ, the, the atonement of Christ. We believe in all of these things, and, and that line of doctrine has been carried all the way forward. Isn't there a, isn't there a, a strong possibility then that that would be the case. Everything that you saw on that list that the Catholics hold to okay. is a man-made theory. There's no support in Scripture. You, you won't find anything about holy water. You won't find anything about the baptism of infants. You won't find any of that. That is man-made. And in the case of the Catholics, if you look at it, in almost all of their, in almost all of their rollouts of new doctrine. When they roll out a new doctrine, it's a method by which they can increase their power. Well, if, if I make it so you have to confess to me rather than to God, who has power over you now? Well, I do, because i got all your secrets. Right? And, and do you think that ever entered the mind of anyone? Oh, yeah, but they made it look sanitized by making it doctrine that they pulled from out-of-context scripture. Would have the Orthodox Church been, did the Roman Catholic Church kind of come out of the, the Orthodox Church? I mean, would the Orthodox Church not be kind of the most original? The Orthodox Church. Now, when you say Orthodox, do you mean the denomination as we would know it today? But the Orthodox Church exists in, in a wouldn't, form. Wouldn't, the, wouldn't the, the Orthodox come out of the, the original apostles? No. The, unless you're using, it depends on how you, that's why I ask. If you're using the word orthodox as a, an adjective, okay, if you say this is, that we are orthodox. Orthodox just means that we are original. We, we go to the original source, okay? So in that way, if I were to say that I'm going to stand up before you and I'm going to present to you orthodox doctrine, that means I'm going to present to you originally sourced biblical doctrine. But there are those who have, there's something called the Orthodox Church, okay? The Russian Orthodox and, and such as that. Yeah, but the Greek, the, would they not be? They would be a split off of the Catholic Church. They would be. Yeah. But are, are, are as, as 
<laughs> it may be a, a group of their own, even though we have a different language. I mean, we may not all believe in God. A Greek and a Latin or a Greek and a yeah. whatever, would they not be, or are they completely separate? They, they would have similarities between them. And I say that they split off of the, the Catholic Church. There would be some who would make the case that they were, they were running parallel to the Catholic Church. But if I were, I don't have the slide, they would be a group that as a group would fit onto the broad way to destruction. They're, they're not, they were not the holders of truth. They were holders. The Orthodox Church is very, very similar to the Catholic Church in, in their doctrines, in their belief, in, in the sacraments and such as that. They would believe very much. The Orthodox Church practices infant baptism, and, and some of them would even go so far as to practice the, the presence of Christ in communion, the, the real presence of Christ. We call it transubstantiation, where they say that the, the bread turns into the literal flesh of Christ, and the, the juice turns into the literal blood of Christ. That, that would be true of some of the orthodox denominations, which gives a tremendous springboard. I'm not going to for sake of time, but this brings us right up to kind of the end of the Dark Ages. Now, we haven't gone as deep as we could, but this brings us up to that point. We're going to talk next week, Lord willing, we're going to go and we're going to we're going to discuss at least a little bit the reformers because that's what came about at the end of the dark ages. We're going to talk about the reformers and we're going to talk about those who held sound doctrine. Okay. Now you say, wait a second, we're going to talk about both of them. Yes, because in many instances, the reformers, they, they came out of the Catholic church. They changed some of their, they changed some of their course, but they didn't go scriptural basis. So we'll look at that. We'll look at, uh, if you know the names uh, John Huss or John Wycliffe, we'll talk about them and we'll talk about some of the, the different things that came out of that. And we're going to, as we move forward, we'll, we'll have the track of the reformers. And sometimes the reformers were right. Sometimes the reformers were just dead wrong. And we'll see the Catholics, they burned, they burned believers at the stake. Guess who else burned believers at the stake? The reformers. The reformers led massive movements against those who said, we're going to abide by scripture. That happened, and we'll look at some of that as we move forward here. Any questions here before we wrap up this morning? If you have deeper questions or you, you, want, you want something to help you go a little bit deeper on these subjects, I've got lots and lots of books that I would love to point you towards, and I can give you some of the some of the warnings about some of the books that you know you can you can believe this but not this on some of them. Uh, I'd love to give you a little bit more direction if you're interested in this or if you have particular questions. If you ask me, I'd love to kind of incorporate that as we move forward because if you have a question, chances are somebody else does too. So let's bow for a word of prayer to close this morning. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. Word. Lord, we thank you for the fact that your word is forever settled in heaven. Lord, we thank you that we don't have to wait for a council to conclude for us to find out what we believe. We can come to scripture and we can know what we've believed and we can know that our souls are eternally secure in Christ. Lord, we thank you for that. I pray that you'd help us as believers, as those who understand the importance of doctrine and doctrinal purity. Lord, I pray that we would be that we would be loving, that we would be kind, but Lord, that we would be willing to make the difficult choices to separate when necessary. I pray that you would guide and direct the rest of our time. Today, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts in every aspect of the service. We pray these things in Jesus' name.